I'm a photographer to capture the feeling of the Caribbean in pictures. There, and remembering the joy of being alive. Like a modern day Columbus, our mission is to rediscover the Caribbean with our cameras. Our journey is plotted nearly 500 years after Columbus's first voyage, followed by the Virgin Islands, then down the Leeward and Windward Islands as far south as Trinidad. We move to the west and the Netherlands Antilles, and then up to Jamaica. Following Columbus's voyages, the first real importance of the Caribbean was this fortress El Moro has withstood the mightiest powers of Europe. It has walls over 40 feet thick, repelled attackers such as Sir Francis Drake. After the Spanish-American War, El Moro was peacefully turned over to the United States, and a new chapter in the history of Puerto Rico began. Today, the emphasis in Puerto Rico is on creating a stronger economy through a plan called Operation Bootstrap. The first business to pull itself up by Operation Bootstrap is the Carib China factory. Let's go inside the factory and see what it takes to make a coffee cup. The necessary ingredients include properly mixed clay, a molding machine, and a quality control system. These photographs were made with natural light inside the factory. We used high-speed film to capture these dimly lit scenes. Finally, the cup is dipped in a glazing solution, fired, glazed, and fired again. The Carib China's customers are international, but some are also their close neighbors. This is the logo for the nearby Saramar Beach Hotel. At the Saramar, activity is a way of life. just a short hop from Puerto Rico to the Virgin Islands. Unlike Columbus, our journey offers us several opportunities to see and photograph these islands from the air. According to legend, Columbus appreciated the feminine shapes and softly veiled atmosphere of these islands. They reminded him of Saint Ursula and her 11,000 mythical virgins, and so he named all these islands the Virgins. On Virgin Gordo, we met Bert and Jackie Kilbride, who were experts at underwater exploration. They pick us up at Little Dick's Bay, and we head out to photograph the wreck of the Rhone. This is one of the most alluring and beautiful shipwrecks in the world. The 300-foot-long British mail packet was only two years old when the hurricane of 1867 broke her in two against the rocks off Salt Island. We're about to start a photographic treasure hunt. Our objective? Bring home the beauty of this shipwreck without removing anything from it. All of our cameras are protected with underwater housings. Along with our professional 16-millimeter movie equipment, 
We use the Kodak XL movie camera because of its ability to make movies in very dim light. We use a light with this camera to provide the necessary illumination inside the pitch black hull. As we dive to a depth of 100 feet, let's listen to Bert describe the wreck. It's a great wreck. There's, everything is there. There's all kinds of things. Uh, pistols. There were a couple of cannons on there. There's one there now. And millions and millions of fish around there. And Jackie, of course, has a few pets there that she feeds, like 100 squirrel fish and a few conies and stuff like that. And, and if we don't feed them, they're going to come up and bite us, you know? <laughs> So Jackie always carries a loaf of bread or something down when in trouble. On the stern of the vessel, there's a little uh, square hole of Lazaret. Uh, when I first discovered this hole, there was nothing. It was filled right up with silt and sand. And uh, I went inside. Uh, we found silver platters and plates and spoons and dishes. And, and they're all at least 125 years old. But the, the Rhone uh, has so many artifacts. We like to get the legislators here to make it a national park. In the area of the French West Indies are the islands of Martinique, Dominica, and Guadeloupe. On Guadeloupe, we have the opportunity to train our cameras and tape recorders on a group of young native folk dancers. The people of the French West Indies inspire picture taking at first sight, especially when you see and hear their traditional folk dances. The particular style that Mme Adeline uses to tie a hat indicates whether a dancer is married, engaged, or just eligible. The older dancers are interpreting a laundry day romance. The subjects are happy, the costumes colorful, and all in all, it makes an excellent subject for anyone's camera. By the way, this is a folklore style of dancing, and it relates to life as it really is here on Guadeloupe. On the neighboring island of Dominica, we photograph ancestors of the island's original inhabitants. They are the Carib Indians who gave their name to the beautiful sea around them. The Caribs live without the need for modern conveniences. They still prepare some of their meals from cornmeal mash, and dig out canoes in the same way their ancestors did 500 years ago. In the days of Columbus, some of the Carib Indians were cannibals, but today, there's a strong relationship with the church. The church of Montmartre is surrounded by the lush forests of Martinique. Martinique has contrasts and scenery that can inspire any photographer. Water is the common denominator for all these islands, so naturally, fishing is the common occupation. It seems as though everybody in this small village got in on the catch. This fishing project started hours earlier when the fishermen laid a net around an area of water larger than a football field. We move our cameras in real close to catch the fresh fish. The fishermen divide the catch right there on the beach and most of it finds its way to the marketplace. After the fishermen hang their nets out to dry, some of them go right back to their boats and race each other. This traditional race in Martinique is simply called the fisherman's race. But the fishermen aren't the only ones racing. 
more than a hundred veteran sailors from some 26 countries come to Martinique to participate in the annual World Championship Sunfish Races. The weekend schedule includes six races run over courses that will vary from six to eight miles. Races of any kind are challenging subjects to photograph. The secret is to get out where the action is and to seek out as many vantage points as possible. We photograph this race from the shore, from a variety of other boats, and even from airplanes. Our next photographic challenge takes us from a 14-foot boat to a 700-foot luxury liner, the Rotterdam. This is a floating luxury hotel. You can set your own pace, time, and appetite. In between ports, there's a variety of activity from soaking up the sun to a game of shuffleboard. The open sea is an excellent target range for trap shooting. The official uniform is a swimsuit. The sport, jousting. The weapons are wet pillowcases filled with balloons. Even if disarmed, it's possible to be a winner. On the southern end of the Grenadines is the Spice Island of Grenada. The natives come out to meet our ship and dive for coins that passengers throw from the upper decks. The harbor at St. George is not quite large enough to handle our ship, so we head for shore in launches. Prevailing winds blowing over the mountains in Grenada drop 200 inches of rain a year, creating an ideal atmosphere for lush, tropical gardens. Grenada was originally settled by the French, but later the English came and planted nutmeg trees. The nutmeg is a seed of a peach-like tropical fruit. When the fruit ripens, it splits in half to reveal the glistening shells of the nutmeg. This lacy crimson covering is called mace. It is often the principal ingredient in delicate French perfumes. It would be pretty hard to guess that your next cup of hot chocolate might begin right here on this tree. The workers split open the ripe cocoa shell to reveal another surprise. Cocoa beans are pure white and gooey. The processing of cocoa beans is very simple. As the cocoa dries, it turns from white to the familiar chocolate brown. And a native dance step called the cocoa bean shuffle speeds up the drying process. Before the daily rains come, the workers protect the beans by pushing the drying racks under the buildings.
throughout the Caribbean, there is a mixture of ethnic strains from all over the world. One of the leading melting pots is Port of Spain, Trinidad, famous for its pre-Lenten carnival. We want to tell a complete carnival story, so naturally, our film crew takes a great variety of photographs, and lots of them. Building grandstands, tuning instruments, and fitting costumes are all part of the story. We used sound cameras to capture the lyrics of a one-time Calypso King to tell us the carnival story. Planning for the grand occasion, the carnival celebration. See we building the grandstand and tuning the steel band. Costume making is like a treat. Sometimes we almost forget time to eat. Carnival, carnival. Enjoy the festival, carnival in Trinidad. Carnival, everybody glad. Carnival, carnival. Right here in Trinidad. Today, Carnival grips all of Trinidad in its annual display of color and pageantry. There are steel band musicians everywhere with a combined sound that's almost deafening. There's no question about it. Calypso is the voice of Carnival. It's the once a year opportunity for all the people and all the entertainers to join in a Calypso festival. Human floats come alive right on stage. These floats are custom fitted to the shape and size of each participant and they are entirely people powered. One person inside each float. For the celebrants, this night runs right into the next day and juve morning. From party, nightclub, and dance hall, everybody out for carnival. Steel band beating in the street. We jump till we get cold feet. If you have in a rum or two, you could jump up too. You go jump, jump, jump up for carnival. Good Lord! We go jump, jump and enjoy the festival. Oh Lord! We go jump in your right hand, hold your coat. In your left hand, your old oak, jump with your wife, so her carnival night. Thousands of natives participate in carnival celebrations, and the culmination of their efforts is the Grand Parade. Just north of the Venezuelan coast are three islands of the Netherlands Antilles. Curaçao was discovered in 1499, and ships have been visiting the island ever since. The British and the French fought over it, the Dutch settled it, and now the tourists are enjoying a real Dutch treat. A must on the tour of this sparkling city is the floating schooner market. The ships bring fresh produce from Venezuela, which is just 30 miles to the south. We pack up our cameras once again and head for Jamaica. One of the most picturesque waterfalls in the world 
is Dunn's River Falls. They are impressive as they send fresh water from the high tropical forests cascading down to the ocean beach. Let's listen to our guide describe them. Dunn's River Falls is a very scenic, interesting place. It's much photographed. It's been used in all the advertising campaigns and everything. Uh, people like the, the excitement of walking up the falls, starting down at the beach. You go over a sort of staircase of rock over which there are cataracts of water. And you get up to the top where it's slightly more placid, and then you go up another staircase. And the water gushing down at you. It's very refreshing to stand underneath these cataracts of water and just, just feel refreshed. Jamaica's answer to jogging? Not really. It's warm-up exercises for limbo. Limbo is mainly done by professionals for entertainment purposes, but it is really a very interesting art because it requires, in some cases, the bending of the back down to a level of six inches, you know, from the ground. And what is very interesting is when, you know, you've got a group of visitors in a nightclub or at some show on the beach or wherever, trying this thing, it, you begin then to recognize the kind of difficulty you get into when you try to go onto a bar that's five feet from the ground, you can't make it. And compare that with somebody who does it six inches from the ground. It is for them a great experience. It is for them an experience of laughter, fun, excitement. Just how low can he go? Here's what we call the pocket camera limbo. squeeze, but he made it. Like Columbus, we return to the Virgin Islands for a second time. This time we come to photograph these beautiful waters from the decks of a sailing ship. For the other passengers and our photo crew, this is a barefoot adventure aboard the three-masted windjammer, the Flying Cloud. Let's listen to our captain, Captain Luffalong Lucas. The Flying Cloud is a barking team which is an archaic rig nowadays, although it was quite a common one back in the clipper ship days. It takes quite a um, number of people to operate a square rigger. We've got about 20 in the crew, but of course a lot of those are cooks and stewards and engineers and so forth. On deck we actually have six seamen, a bosun, and the first officer and myself. Apart from uh, working on things like raising sails and washing decks and so forth, the crew actually spend most of their time chipping paint and painting and um, helping passengers carry baggage, running launches back and forth. Uh, when we're raising sail, we usually start by heading up into the wind with uh, the help of the motor if necessary. And we start from aft, raising the after sails first. Uh, all these sails are raised by halyards, and you can see the people pulling on the halyards. Uh, we try and get as many as we can, as much weight, and very often the passengers will pitch in and give us a hand and so forth. Once the sail is up, then we sheet it in. The sheet is the line that comes off the back of the sail, usually the end of the boom, if it's on a boom. And you tighten that in so that the sail lies in fairly flat. Um, and if you're running off the wind, then you would let it out again a little bit. Altogether, four and a half, we've got about 12,000 square feet of sail. And with the two square sails added, be another 8,000, so a total of about 20,000 square feet of sail. If you look back up there on the end of the main yard, you'll see a long rope coming down to the deck. And you can stand way up there on the bow and do a Douglas Fairbanks off into the water and then let go. But there is a certain etiquette connected with using the rope, which I'd like you to observe. In the first place, before you let go, check your impact area. In other words, if there's somebody down there in ground zero, then be sure that you're not going to drop on top of them. Secondly, when you get out there, and it sounds a little basic, but let go. 
because very frequently people start swinging back toward the ship and everybody yells, let go, and laughing in panic. Thirdly, don't let any part of the rope get between your legs, because if you get out there and you drop and the rope's between your legs, you're liable to get a nasty surprise when you let go. Somehow the fresh salt air and the warm sunshine really season the appetite. After an active morning and a big meal, it's time to just relax in the sun. The variety of our photographs is limited only by our imagination and ability to seek out unusual viewpoints. We found unusual viewpoints on the bowsprit and by climbing the ratlins to the crow's nest. This has been an exciting photo assignment. We found a variety of picture treasures throughout the Caribbean, on the sand, in the sea, and everywhere under the warm tropical sun.